My name is Joe O'Brien, better known as J.J. O'Brien. I was born in Waycross, Georgia, November the 11th, 1924. Uh, we're filming this here at the Camp Landing World War II Museum, which I'm a volunteer. I've been out here for maybe 12 to 14 years as a volunteer. A couple of years ago, I was nominated to be the Volunteer of the Year, which is quite an honor. On December the 7th, I was, at that time, I was in high school, and I was working uh, a part-time job at the Arcade Theater in Jacksonville. Uh, the word came in that something had happened. <laughs> so we didn't know exactly when or where or what. But the military had ordered all the military personnel we had there from Camp Landing and also Naval Air Station back to their bases. <laughs> then we found out that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, at the time, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. They didn't say Hawaii. They just said Pearl Harbor. And so we found out later when the papers came out and explained to us where it was at. But it's kind of a sinking feeling because, you know, you, the country's at war, and uh, everybody was expecting it, but didn't know when it would happen. It did. And uh, we, we knew what that was going to be. I graduated from high school, June 1942. So you know what that meant. Just about, I'd say, 99% of all my classmates served in the military from that graduation class. So I had about three, four months, and I had to register for the draft. And the next thing, I was here at Camp Landing. I stayed at Camp Landing about two weeks. At that time, it was a real hub of activity. There was a lot going on. So, and after that, I was uh, sent to North Carolina, Seymour Johnson Field, North Carolina, to be for basic training with the Air Corps. After basic training there, after several months, I was sent to Lowry Field, Denver, Colorado, where I attended uh, photo school. We were there about four or five months in school, and then from there I went to Colorado Springs for a short time, Peterson Field, then to uh, Oklahoma City, Will Rogers Field. We stayed there for several months, getting prepared to go overseas. They were organizing new photo units, and they were going to various theaters of war. Each squadron was a complete squadron. We had everything. Basically, it was the, most people in it were lab technicians and photo interpreters. But we also had our own electricians, our own cooks, our own truck drivers, our own medics. We were a complete unit. No matter where we went, we were equipped to do what we had to do. Once we left uh, Will Rogers Field, took a troop train across to California, to Riverside, California, Camp Anza. Stayed there about a week. They got a shipload. They took us down to the docks, loaded us up, waved goodbye, and we took off. To, uh, three weeks later, we arrived in Perth, Australia. After we left Australia, uh, several days out in the Indian Ocean, we had some kind of an alert. We, at the time, we didn't know what it was, but they were doing a lot of zigzagging and trying to get away. Found out later that a Jap sub had fired three torpedoes at our ship. Missed all of them, thankfully. Then we went up to Bombay and was there for a day, unloaded off the ship, onto the train. One day out on the train, the entire harbor blew up in Bombay. An ammunition ship blew up. So it blew up every, all the ships that were in there. There we loaded on trains, went from Bombay to Calcutta, and then north from Calcutta up to the uh, Gushkara, which is up near the Burmese border. We had just got there. Uh, the next thing we knew, we were told that the Japanese were advancing toward our base. We were going to have to help defend the airfield. <laughs> that would have been a heck of a battle because we weren't a combat unit. The first night we were there, I had to pull guard duty. All right, and every time I pulled guard duty in the States, I had a loaded uh, weapon. We got overseas the first night, no ammo. All the ammo would fit M1s. We had carbines. The next day, we had some, but that was a long night that night. 
we were at the end of the supply line. If things ran out, we had to wait till next month. We just didn't get all the new stuff that was issued or everything else. We, we never got it. We, uh, we was at the end of the line. So kind of a stepchild of the war, I guess you'd call it. As I said, they created um, uh, our type of squadron. It was something new, a new concept. We made aerial photographs, which was made into maps for all the forces in the uh, China Burma Theater. Our photo planes start off with actually were P-40s. Then they got the newer aircraft in was the P-38s. So everybody on our side was supposed to be getting the maps. It was the British, the Chinese, the, uh, the Americans, whoever it happened to be. Overall mileage, the CBI theater was the largest theater of war in World War II because it covered China, Burma, and India, which is a lot of territory. Right now, you can pick up a book about World War II. It, can, it might have 100 pages in it. You do good to have one page in there about the CBI. Uh, a lot of people didn't know we had a war going over there. I've been asked by veterans. They should know better. So where did you serve? I told them. Did they have a war over there? I said, well, if they didn't, they were damn sure shooting at us. You know, it was, it was a war going on, believe me. Well, it, it accomplished the mission of tying up troops that the Japanese would have used against our other forces in the Pacific. In fact, they had several divisions in there. The Japanese did. Uh, we, had, we had one battalion of American ground troops is all we had there. The rest of them were all of the British Empire, and the one we had was called Merrill's Marauders, uh, of which later years I had two good friends in Jacksonville who were members of the uh, Merrill's Marauders. The first people that had, the Americans that flew in China was the ABG, which was called the Flying Tigers, composed of American flyers. They resigned their commissions, technically, went to work for China. Uh, they, they was only in existence for about six months, and after that, the, uh, at the war started, we, we were in it. Then we declared war, and so they made the 14th, made the Flying Tigers part of the 14th Air Force in China. A lot of those flyers stayed with the 14th. A lot of them came back to other other places. Some of them had been to the Marines, some had been in the Navy. They went back to the original units. Well, Japan wanted to control the entire Orient. That's why they tried to take everything over. They took China, they took the Philippines, they took everything else. And, of course, in China, you had a lot of natural resources, you had a lot of manpower. The Chinese and the Japanese had been fighting for quite a while before the, we got into the war. The Japanese had just about cut China off from, from all supplies. They had cut the Burma Road, they cut everything else. So these 
the, the CBI theater was created to help China stay in the war, to tie up Japanese forces there that would not be used in the Pacific against our forces in the islands. And to keep China into the war, she had to have help. So that was our basic mission on the Americans' part to, uh, to do that. And uh, we had, like we said, we had all kind of different units over there working. You had engineering units that were building the Burma Road, uh, engineering units that were building the pipeline into China. Uh, we had also had the uh, ATC flying supplies over the hump, which is the Himalayas, into China. And until they got the road open, that was the only way they could supply them. And we lost a lot of planes over there. Well, at the beginning of the war, the Japanese controlled all the airspace on the lower parts of the Himalayas. So therefore, our planes had to fly the highest peaks in the Himalayas. And a lot of them were overloaded. Uh, they weren't equipped to fly that high, and we lost a lot of them. And later, after we knocked the Japanese out of the air, we controlled the air power, then they could fly the hump on the lower areas. And by that time, we had the larger aircraft, the C-46s and the such, that could make the trip more profitable to carry in supplies. The Burma Road was created to connect India to China uh, as a supply line. All right, the Japanese cut that line when they ran the Americans and stuff out of Burma in the early 44, just before we got there. And they were getting ready to invade India. But the Burma Road, then was, after it was cut, then the Americans started building another road to connect it to, to uh, called the uh, Stillwell Road. They named it after General Stillwell. And then, of course, parts of it later was called the Lido Road. It was, eventually, they got it all joined and went together. Over there, we, we always had a running statement that if you stood on the corner in Calcutta for a while, you could see the world go by. Because you had troops there from the entire British Commonwealth. You had uh, Troops from North Africa, you had troops from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, you name it. And, uh, and of course, England also, and of course, in the Americans. But um, it was just, it was a conglomeration. Then, of course, you had up in the jungles, you had the, the uh, Burmese uh, fighting, and the, the Gurkhas, we had the Gurkhas, which were real good soldiers. Probably the best soldiers we had were the Gurkhas. But, um, it was just, uh, just a big mixture of the whole works. If the ABG hadn't have got in there to start off with, and then the Americans and British later, uh, China would have been defeated, I think. I guess the worst thing about the whole thing was that we were so far away from home, it was just uh, one of those things, but, and not knowing when you'd ever get home. Because when you signed on the dotted line, it was duration plus six months, and that could have been Ten years plus six, but we didn't know. The population over there was unbelievable, and I understand it's more now. Uh, it's just that, and you, over there you had from top to bottom, you had some of the richest people in the world, the Maharajas. You had some of the poorest in the world, the, the lower classes, and they did, definitely did not mix. They had a caste system of everything, and it's just. Uh, it's just a different way of life than what we were used to. Well, I had the opportunity to go up, travel up to a British rest camp at Darjeeling. We had to take a regular gauge train up to the foot of the Himalayas. From there on, it was an iron gauge railroad all the way up in the mountains. Then, from there on, we had to go up by a truck. And the last few feet, you either had to go ride on a horse or walk. Uh, and that was in the summertime, snow everywhere, it was cold, and we were actually in sight of Mount Everest. We could see it. You get up early in the morning, you could see it before the haze all come in. But that's where it was at. But it was cold up there. Well, I had the opportunity to see visit a monastery. <laughs> kind of reminded me of the um, movie Lost Horizon. And uh, the monks there, they had these orange robes, and uh, they would sit there with the door and work their beads and uh, of course as you went out the door they gave you the universal sign and hold the palm out so we had to cross your palm a little bit you know which we didn't mind <laughs> we the last big thing we worked on in conjunction with the navy 
was a mapping of the invasion of Japan for the invasion of Japan. Uh, after that was finished, we packed up all of our gear. Uh, we're sitting at an airfield, or airstrip, because the base we was at was not an airstrip, it was just a base. So we had to move over to an airfield and uh, was waiting on transportation to fly the hump into China for the follow-up of the invasion of Japan. Of course, we, my outfit wouldn't have been involved in the invasion because we weren't that tight, but we'd have been involved in it. Uh, then the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, of course, we had never heard of an atomic bomb and didn't know what it was. So then, a few days later, they dropped the second one on Nagasaki. And uh, that convinced them. So that was it. Came home on the General Muir. Here at the, the museum, I usually tell these people when I show them the pictures of the troop ships, I tell them, see, that's the way they were loaded to go into Europe. They'd take them seven, five, ten days, they'd be in Europe. Our, that's when they loaded them so tight. On ours, we weren't quite that close, but we was on it for 33 days, which is a long time. And uh, at that time, I crossed the equator twice, crossed the date line, I had two months sea duty, and I was in the Army, I wasn't in the Navy. Then I got back to New York, stayed there a couple of days at Camp Kilmer, so went troop train back down to Camp Landing, uh, went into the area there, so it looked like I was about two barracks away from where I started. So to make the world trip complete, I walked over to this other two barracks. I didn't want to be short a few miles. I made the trip all the way around the world. <laughs> we was getting ready to leave. I looked at the back of the room where we were at. I saw my dad standing back there. Because he couldn't see me, because he told me later, he said, I looked in there and that thing was full of people that all dressed alike and he couldn't see me. <laughs> so when I got outside the door, there was my reception committee. I had mom. Dad, my brother Jack, my sister Lorraine, and my aunt and uncle from, from uh, Georgia. They all went me there. After it all said and done, I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience, but I wouldn't give you a nickel to do it again. Well, when I got home, uh, of course I was behind on my courting, so I had to get started again through my sister, who I met Pat. So then we courted for a while, and a couple of times I think she kind of kicked me down. And so we went to start over again. But uh, finally it worked out real good. So we were married March the 3rd, 1951, in Jacksonville. 63 years, this, this uh, coming March the 3rd, and they said it wouldn't last. <laughs>